you are getting quiet, you must expect something to happen up here. <laughs> so, uh, okay, let's see what you can do. So, uh, good evening, I'm Ed Welch, President of the University of Charleston, and uh, welcome to the uh, University of Charleston Speaker Series, sponsored by Dow Chemical Foundation. Uh, this uh, tonight will be a conversation on energy and the environment. It's the second in a five-part series that we are doing on the topic of energy, as uh, many of you know. The next one will be on Thursday night, March the 8th, with David Porges, who is the CEO of EQT, which is a major gas company located in Pittsburgh, I believe. So uh, come back for that. Uh, again, we thank sincerely Jim Guitarini and the Dow Chemical Foundation, sitting right up front row, uh, for their continuing support of this series. They are very indulgent and uh, trusting that we will not embarrass them too much. Uh, and we appreciate their letting us have some rain to schedule programs that we think will be of interest and helpful. We do do questions and answers uh, at the end. Uh, so if you have things you want to ask, I hope there are cards available and you can write things out and uh, I'll probably pass them to the center aisle. Somebody will pick them up and give me samples of things that are uh, of interest, and we will ask those questions of our guests. I encourage you to turn off noisemakers uh, so they don't interrupt us. Uh, that would be uh, kind and polite. I also want to introduce uh, two particular stars from the Daily Mail today. Hajar Yogloff is here and Leanne Brown. They are helping me research and prepare for these programs. So uh, stand up and let people see you. You're great. Thank you. <laughs> so if I make mistakes, uh, that's my fault. But if I sound halfway intelligent, they've set me up to do that. So uh, it's a good experience. Eben Goodstein is the director of the Bard Center for Environmental Policy, and he's the founding director of Bard's new MBA program on sustainability. He earned his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. Don't know how many West Virginia coaches were there when he was there, but that's where he was. In 1999, he founded the Greenhouse Network, an organization dedicated to supporting the clean energy movement through education. He directs two national educational initiatives on global warming. C2C is one of that, those, and it stands for Campus to Congress, Campus to Capital, Campus to City Hall, and Campus to Corruption. Corporation. Corporations, <laughs> I was gonna say. I read that on a release someplace. I said, that's not a parallel. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and he directs the National Climate Seminar. So with all of that editing, uh, we'll begin the conversation and thanks so much for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Well, we'll hop right into it. You are interested in climate change. And so is climate change a fact, a theory, or a hoax? There are people who claim each of those words. Well, you know, we're alive at a truly extraordinary moment in, in human history. And um, I tend to, and I turned 50 a couple years ago. Um, and my students are typically in their 20s, so I tend to think in terms of 30s. And uh, so 30 years from now, uh, I'll be 80. and. Uh, they'll be my age 50, and we'll really know at that point the future of the Earth, okay? And we're going to know how many people are going to be on the planet, whether there'll be 9 or 10 or 11 billion people, but we'll know more fundamentally how hot it's going to get and whether global warming is going to drive the planet uh, 4 degrees Fahrenheit hotter or 12 degrees Fahrenheit hotter. And to put those numbers in perspective, during the last ice age, uh, a period of time when my office up in New York uh, just 150 or 200 miles north of here, was covered by, I think that's about right, was covered by uh, several hundred feet of ice, the world was only nine degrees Fahrenheit colder than it is right now. So my students, our kids, are looking at the very real possibility of a swing in global temperatures of ice age magnitude within their lifetimes only in the opposite direction. Now, I say that 
with confidence. And why do I say that with confidence? Well, I think about the climate change issue very similar to the tobacco issue, if you will, okay? So we all know, right, that cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. We don't believe that. We don't think it's a hoax. We know it. We know it as a scientific fact. Now, where did that fact come from? Well, about 60, 70 years ago, we began to see big increases in lung cancer. Scientists had a pretty good hypothesis that that might be associated with cigarette smoking, uh, but we didn't know it as a fact. It was a hypothesis. Um, we also saw a strong correlation, right, between cigarette smokers and folks who got lung cancer. Now, it wasn't a perfect correlation, so there were some people who got lung cancer who didn't smoke cigarettes, and some people who smoked cigarettes didn't get lung cancer. And so there was uncertainty and doubt about that. Now, what happened? Well, the scientific community went to work, uh, lots of studies, hundreds, thousands of peer-reviewed studies done, digging deeper into the link, understanding the connections, and in more particular, ruling out other causes, right? Looking at all other possible explanations for why lung cancer would be accelerating. Okay. It's a very similar situation with global warming. The planet's been heating up for 100 years rapidly over the last 40 years. Uh, well outside the range of anything that we've uh, experienced uh, through natural variation. Uh, we have a, th a very simple hypothesis to explain that. It actually goes back 100 and over 100 years to Sven Arrhenius, who first hypothesized that the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, it's a heat-trapping gas, it lets light in, it doesn't let heat out, that that accumulation of heat-trapping gas in the atmosphere would warm the planet. That was you know, first suggested back then. So, beginning about 20 years ago, there was a massive coordinated international scientific effort to sort this out because it's pretty important to the future of humanity. Um, and there's been now thousands of peer-reviewed studies, people exploring the data. We've got incredibly good ice core data, we were just talking about this, that shows an incredibly powerful correlation between what's happened to temperature in the past and the thickness of the blanket of carbon dioxide that surrounds the planet. In the past, as that blanket's gotten thicker, the planet's gotten hotter. And when the blanket's gotten thinner, the planet's gotten cooler. So lots of evidence, and scientists have bent over backwards exploring all other possible explanations. Is there some other reason the planet could be heating up so fast? And they ruled it out, okay? And so what we're left with is a consensus, and let's be clear what that means. It doesn't mean that every scientist in the world thinks this, but it means that there's wide, wide, widespread agreement. 95% uh, of people who actually study climate science uh, have published in the period peer-reviewed literature, uh, except this, what was a hypothesis, more carbon dioxide, warmer planet, as a scientific fact. Um, so that's where we're at. Well, the next question that goes with that is, uh, is the warming being caused by human behavior? Yes, and, and the answer is yes. Uh, again, so the, the consensus view, as I suggested, what I mean by that is 95% right. of scientists will tell you that most of the warming that we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years is likely due, very likely due, excuse me, very likely due to the accumulation of, of greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide, but also methane and uh, nitrous oxide and uh, CFCs in the atmosphere. So, uh, yes, in answer to that question. Now, we did have, just two weeks ago, you know, a letter from 17 scientists in the Wall Street Journal on the editorial page claiming that this wasn't true, okay? Wall Street Journal editorial page is not the best place to get your scientific information, but um, uh, of those scientists, one was an astronaut, one was a medical doctor. There were two scientists who uh, have legitimacy, who've actually done scientific research in the climate area, and those are really the two scientists who would still sign that letter. They're, they would have had more, obviously, if there were more, but that's sort of the state of where we're at in terms of, of the scientific consensus. It's a very powerful consensus at this point. I hope they're wrong, honestly. I hope it doesn't get hotter year after year, but uh, that's the trajectory that we're on. Would you call yourself an alarmist? Uh, never would I call myself an alarmist. All right. I would call myself an economist. Yeah, all right. that's, okay. a good, that's a good one. Um, <clears throat> but on the issue about climate change, I mean, are you uh, alarmed at what is happening, and do you believe that there are all kinds of things that we should be doing to try to reduce these effects? I'm very concerned, absolutely. Um, and if we take the alarmist out of the politicized context in which it's become, so that's kind of the alarmist is the counterpart to the 
denialist, right. you know, and I don't really want to go there. I think that's an appropriate thing for an academic forum. Um, is, you know, my own thing is that, yeah, I mean, this to me is, is, as I suggested, we're looking, and it was really interesting, in response to that Wall Street Journal article, um, Andy Revkin, who was a New York Times journalist, said, well, you know, not only did these guys get the science wrong, they also got the economics wrong. And he convened an a, a email conversation among top economists in the country talking about what should we be doing about this. And economists who study this, again, all say, yeah, we need to be starting right now. And in particular, what we need to be doing is buying an insurance policy against catastrophic outcomes. If the planet heats up four degrees Fahrenheit, it's, it's heated up about a degree and a half Fahrenheit over the last hundred years. And already, Arctic ice caps are melting, spring is coming two weeks earlier in the northern hemisphere, glaciers are melting, sea levels rising, animals, plants are migrating, uh, and we're seeing a big increase in extreme weather events. So that's the, so our kids are locked into three times that much warming. We can handle that, you know, as a civilization. Uh, but there's a non-trivial and growing probability that, that we could be pushing up in the 10 or 11 or 12 degree Fahrenheit range, which would be very challenging. So mm -hmm. economists view this as an insurance problem. Uh, there's, there's a significant probability of really bad things happening. And what you do in that context, you know, there's a significant probability your house would, would or small, but significant probability your house is going to burn down. Mm -hmm. So you buy insurance. So that's the way okay. economists think about it. Okay. Uh, have the conferences and summits and treaties that have occurred so far uh, had any impact? Do they give you hope that uh, we're going to be able to try to mitigate some of these uh, causes? You know, the, the politics is always a challenging, you know, world. Uh, and um, I think I gain more hope from, from uh, the technological progress that we've seen driven in part by policy. So I don't think you can d d d divorce those. But, um, uh, and we'll probably talk about these technologies in a, in, 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 in a little while. But I mean, I think that uh, addressing these issues, and by that I mean holding global warming to about four degrees Fahrenheit, is not an economic or technical challenge. Um, uh, we've got smart engineers, we've got good technologies, we know how to drive technologies to scale and lower their costs. So if we put our minds to it, uh, collectively as a nation and also as a globe, this is a doable project. I think the question is an open question about whether we have the policies and political will and structures that are going to support that process. In one of your books you write about abrupt climate change yep. and have these kind of horrific scenarios. Um, what's your motivation for sharing the scenarios? Do you think they're realistic? Yes, unfortunately. Um, and I just shared one. I mean, if the planet goes to 12 degrees Fahrenheit, we will with certainty melt all of the ice uh, in the West Antarctic ice sheet and all of the ice in Greenland and probably a lot of it in the East Antarctic ice sheet, which would raise global sea levels somewhere between 40 and 70 feet, which would wipe out most of the valuable cultural and economic real estate on the planet. Now, that wouldn't happen overnight. It would take somewhere between a few hundred and a few thousand years for that process to fully play out. Um, but it would be irreversible. There'd be no going back. And if we do trigger that kind of event in the next uh, few decades, if we cross some emissions threshold that locks in a temperature increase that, that uh, begins the catastrophic or the collapse of those, those big continental ice sheets, our kids would be looking at up to two meters of, of sea level rise this century. And, uh, again, that would be very challenging for hundreds of millions of people around the world. So uh, as an economist, again, the way I think about this problem is there are uncomfortably large risks of really bad stuff happening, and in those circumstances, you know, insurance is the right way to go. Okay. Uh, so what are the kinds of insurance policies you think that we ought to take out? Well. If we think about how we're going to solve this problem, um, the problem is the thickness of the carbon blanket, okay? The thickness of this blanket of carbon dioxide that's wrapping the planet. Now, it started out at 280 parts per million pre-industrial. It's now at about 390 parts per million. It goes up about two to three parts per million every year. If we work really hard, we could hold that to 450 parts per million, okay? 
Now, what that means is and, um, that over the next uh, 40 years, um, we would have to cut carbon emissions globally about 60%. And that in the United States, that would mean about 80 percent. And then by the end of the century, virtually eliminate carbon dioxide production from our economic system. So unhook from what uh, people have called the addiction to fossil fuels, right? Now, that may not sound like an economically or technologically feasible thing to do, right? Um, but I'd ask you to think about what was the emission, what was the major emission source from the transportation sector 100 years ago? What was the major pollutant from transportation 100 years ago? Yeah, you got it, horse poop, right? Yeah. And so we've definitely managed to reduce emissions of horse poop by well over 90% over the last 100 years, right? And, uh, and, and so we went from horses to cars, and we've got to go from cars to something else. And that something else is not a mystery. It's well known that we need to produce electricity from clean energy sources, wind, solar, geothermal, uh, sustainable biofuels, uh, uh, and, and, and then once we have that clean uh, electricity, then we can use it to run our vehicles on batteries or we could make hydrogen uh, and burn the hydrogen in our vehicles or, or, or run high, uh, fuel cells. So there's a very, very rich menu of technological opportunities that we could envision that would allow us to make that sort of a transition. Now, whether we will or not is, you know, a big question. Mm -hmm. Well, let's run through some of the uh, energy alternatives and have you expressed mm -hmm. some views on this. Uh, one of those is uh, moving more to natural gas, because mm -hmm. natural gas, uh, when you burn it, doesn't give off as much CO2. Yep. Uh, it does give off methane, which mm -hmm. is another set of problems, right. which is uh, not a green gas. Right. So um, uh, should we be moving more toward natural gas? Yeah. Um, well, you know, as you all know, I'm sure being from this part of the world, uh, there's been a revolution in natural gas production in the last few years with the introduction of hydraulic fracking. Um, and uh, uh, that's opened up a whole new set of deposits that weren't previously available. Um, now, uh, we've had kind of a rush to development in Pennsylvania, which has been sort of the guinea pig for exploring these issues. A lot of conventional pollution and land use conflicts have emerged as a consequence. Uh, you know, how much water do you need? You know, what's in the fracking chemicals? Can it get into the land? Can it get into the groundwater? Um, so we're sorting through all those things. And my sense is that none of those are going to be sort of, uh, they're all things that are potentially manageable um, and will allow us to develop the um, natural gas in this part of the world. Um, but from a global warming perspective, uh, people were very excited about natural gas because just from a combustion point of view, it, it emits a lot less uh, uh, carbon dioxide than does coal. But the problem with natural gas is that it itself is a global warming pollutant. Um, and so if you get methane into the atmosphere, this is one of the things that traps heat. And it's actually a more powerful global warming pollutant than carbon dioxide. So people started looking at the mines and they said, well, are there fugitive emissions that are coming out of the wells that aren't being trapped by the, by the gas companies. And it appears that there are. And if there are uh, emissions of say 4% is getting out, then that kind of cancels the, the benefits of natural gas as this sort of transition fuel. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic that we can solve that problem as well because there's an economic incentive, right? Uh, the companies probably didn't even know they were losing that much gas because who cared, right? But now that they know it's there, they uh, hopefully can develop technologies that will allow them to capture it and sell it. Mm -hmm. So um, there's another issue here, which is that abundant natural gas is making it harder for renewables to compete uh, in the new electric market. I think that one will probably fade as well because that's a supply and demand issue. We happen to have a glut of natural gas right now, but demand won't, uh, supply won't run ahead of demand forever. Yeah. Is it reasonably safe to burn? Natural gas to get to or burn the methane methane that's coming out of it. Yeah, I mean it's it's um, it's much cleaner than coal from a conventional pollutant perspective as well. Um, so uh, it is a if you could back out some coal plants and and replace them with uh, natural gas plants, then you're going to see a, a a reduction in 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 both conventional pollutants as well as um, uh, as well as global warming gases. Right now, we're seeing a fair amount of uh, negative reaction to fracking. 
uh, worried, as you said, about uh, the water and what that does mm -hmm. uh, when you put the water in the ground. Uh, worried about uh, now fears that uh, it might cause earthquakes and what's happening mm -hmm. in Ohio because mm -hmm. we haven't mm -hmm. seen that happen before. Yep. Uh, those are environmental concerns as well. Uh, how do they rate on your scale of things to be worried about? Well, I think the big issue that natural gas faces is, uh, is water. Um, and uh, if, if, the, if the companies are going to continue to suck lots of fresh water into the system, then they're going to run into problems because that's going to be, a, you know, we had the food, food versus fuel conflict with biofuels. It's a similar kind of issue. Now, I think that's a solvable problem because they can go to recycling. Um, and uh, that makes sense from a lot of perspectives. And so if they can back down the water use that, that they've been demanding, um, and can move to, um, to recycling uh, the fracking fluid and really containing it, um, then I think it's, you know, you know, you won't see as much fracking as you otherwise would, but it'll be done much more sensibly and without the kind of backlash that would otherwise emerge. Um, you know, the question was... Just uh, how concerned um, you are about those uh, environmental consequences of the process yeah, of yeah. producing natural gas. Yeah, or, and in general, I think the Pennsylvania example is a case of where they just, they rush too fast, not enough regulation, too many mistakes made, backlash. And this is the way the whole process works. So now anybody who's moving forward is going to take a much closer look at it. They might overregulate, you know, so there's that kind of dynamic. But I don't think it will substantially slow the industry down. You are, as you know, in West Virginia, so you mm -hmm. do need to say something about another four-letter word called mm -hmm. coal. Yeah. Um, what's the future of coal, and uh, is it really the big, mean pollutant that uh, is, is described yeah. to be? Well, well, 30 years ago, when I was in college, I worked for the Tennessee Consolidated Coal Company when I grew up in south-central Tennessee. Um, and the, I was doing um, uh, reclamation work, and it was a different industry back then, as everybody here knows. Uh, uh, production levels were actually, uh, haven't really gone down, but roughly the same, a little bit down from then, but, um, but the industry has changed a lot. Uh, and so back then, you know, the, the farmers down in the, in the coves and the valleys who, were, you know, they were fighting the coal companies about, uh, about 10 acre strip mines. Um, and, and of course now what's happened is the industry's consolidated into much larger operations um, with, with mountaintop removal operations. So it's, it's a very different industry. It employs, uh, again, with roughly the same production levels, just down a little bit, there were two and a half times as many people working in the coal industry back when I worked in it. Um, so it's an industry that is, you know, in this part of the world anyway, has just seen continuous declines in employment. Um, uh, while out west, where they can really do surface mining, um, you know, that's where the, the big growth in production has been. But so, it's still inexpensive yeah. fuel. Inexpensive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you don't factor in the sort of external, co what cost. economists call the social costs yeah. or external costs. Uh, and so, uh, you, you know, what I, what I my, my, my story here about this is um, coal has this problem. I mean, they've have, coal's got a lot of problems. <laughs> you know, it's been the backbone of industrialization, you know, since the 18, whatever, 40s 40, or 50s. 50s. Um, and, you know, thank God for that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. been, it's really, you know, led to the, the rise of, of, you know, of, of modern civilization. Mm -hmm. But it really is an 18th century fuel in some, 19th century fuel in some ways. And uh, those chickens are starting to come home to roost with new mercury rules and, uh, you know, et cetera. I think global warming is going to pose a huge challenge for West Virginia frankly, um, and the industry, because it's going to keep getting hotter. Now, I hope I'm wrong about this. And if I come back in 10 years and I'm wrong, I'll, I'll say I'm so thankful I was wrong, okay? But I think it's going to keep getting hotter. That's what the science suggests. And coal is half the problem uh, as far as that goes. So you think um, there is something called clean coal that we're going to be able to find some way to 
get the CO2 uh, and other pollutants, uh, capture them in some way? Well, uh, we certainly have made progress in terms of conventional pollutants with coal. There's no question about it. And uh, uh, my understanding is that you can essentially, if you gasify the coal, you can essentially replicate a natural gas plant in terms of conventional pollutants. Um, the challenge with CO2 is that you would actually have to strip the gas out as it comes out of the flue and then pump it underground and store it there. Um, and my understanding is that barring any major technological innovations, that's going to be quite expensive. Um, and so you have coal going like this in terms of expense. You've got solar and wind prices dropping like that. And so, um, and also, Centralized power plant technology is also a 19th century or maybe a 20th century technology because the, the direction, of course, that everything is moving is in light, distributed, small. Uh, with a natural gas plant right now, you can essentially just hook up a jet engine and produce sufficient power at, at, at low megawatt scales in a very competitive environment. Uh, if we're moving towards distributed solar where everybody's got solar on their roof or in their clothes or whatever, the economics of centralized power plant production are going to look worse and worse. Um, so, you know, there's that technological risk here. You know, you're going to invest in a coal plant that's supposed to be producing power for 50 years. Mm -hmm. But gosh, 20 years from now, who knows whether anybody's even going to want to buy that power because they might be, get, you know, there might be cheap solar cells. So there's there's some investment risk, a lot of investment risk, not even factoring in the climate side that you have to think about if you're going to build a coal plant. Mm -hmm. yeah. The ones that are already operating obviously have a extensive investment in them, yep. and making conversion is also uh, uh, extraordinarily expensive, and uh, it remains to be seen whether the companies that are invested in that production are willing to change or going to be forced to change, but you're suggesting that the capitalistic competition itself may uh, uh, encourage a change because of increasing price of coal. Well, not the price of coal, price of coal power. Price of coal, right. Price of coal right. power. And I think, uh, I think also the price of alternative right. forms of power, especially if you look out 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start talking about the renewable energy sources and mm -hmm. alternative uh, energy sources. Uh, Nick Aiken was here uh, last uh, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, CEO of uh, American Electric Power, uh, and he talked about the ways in which they are investing in alternative uh, sources. Uh, so before we talk about each one individually, do you think the uh, federal government uh, or other entities should be requiring, encouraging, rewarding investment in alternative energy sources? How should we be getting this going? Well, um, so let me tell a story about wind power, okay? So um, back when I was in college and when I was working at the coal company, there was no such thing as commercial wind power. It didn't exist. I mean, it just didn't exist. And if you wanted to build, you wanted to produce power from wind, it would have cost you, I don't know, 30 cents a kilowatt hour, something like that. Um, this was the late 1970s. We'd just gone through two oil shocks. Uh, oil prices had, had quadrupled and quadrupled again. U.S. Congress was worried about uh, dependence on Middle East oil, kind of a familiar refrain. Uh, and uh, so they invested at the time a fair amount of money, about $4 billion in uh, clean energy technology research. Uh, California, often a, a leader in these issues, kind of set up their own set of incentives. And uh, you had a rush to wind, right? And uh, in, in the case of wind and also uh, baseload solar, so concentrated solar power, these uh, subsidies were incredibly effective. And so by the mid-1990s, uh, wind prices in California had come down to about five cents a kilowatt hour. California was the world leader in installed wind power capacity at that time. And now globally, we're you know, at what, 400,000 megs or something like that. And again, if you've got access to transmission and a good site, wind power is among the cheapest electricity generating sources in the world. So, government investment works, okay? I can tell you that government investment works. That's an example where it worked. Um, we could look at the jet engine, we could look at the silicon chip, we could look at the internet. All of those technologies uh, were funded initially and very generously by Uncle Sam. So, 
I'm an economist, I could talk about why that's necessary, infant industries, you know, the nature of the technologies. In this particular case, if we didn't have global warming out there, I would say let the industry sort of develop at kind of whatever pace they were going to develop. But if we want to hold climate to four degree Fahrenheit warming, we got to do this really fast. And the good thing about this is we're not talking about real money from the government's perspective. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars or maybe tens of billions of dollars to uh, incentivize and uh, rapidly develop solar power, uh, fuel cells, battery storage technology. The military is very interested in this stuff. So the Defense Department is putting a lot of money behind it because they don't want to defend fuel lines and they don't want to have, you know, frontline operations where they're spending, you know, half of their money um, on, on power costs. So there's just a lot of good reasons to do this and, um, and I would say, yeah, I mean, of all the things that Uncle Sam's spending his money on right now, I would say this is uh, the wisest possible investment that we could be making. Well, you talked about wind, so uh, let's start there. Uh, wind is not without its critics. Uh, mm -hmm. You put it up on top of a mountain ridge and you ruin the view. Uh, yeah. Birds and bats, uh, possibilities of fires in uh, engines uh, that are running it, possibility of chemical leaks from the fluids that are running the uh, yeah. equipment. Uh, those are negative environmental uh, consequences. Uh, how do you balance all of that out with saying uh, uh, we ought to be doing more wind uh, yeah. energy. Yeah. Well, I would say that I think the future of wind is offshore. Um, I think that's where you're going to see the very big utility scale wind developments. Um, and uh, the reason we've been able to push that is because we've done onshore and we've kind of learned our lessons. Um, one of the consequences of cap competition, capitalist competition, is that as we've had falling wind energy, uh, gas prices, the, the wind industry has responded. They're building much more and bigger and more efficient turbines. Um, I mean, my best response to kind of the industrial accident thing is, you know, what happens, you know, if a wind turbine falls down? Well, it falls down, right? What happens if a nuclear power plant has a problem? You know, Fukushima. So wind is sort of inherently not a technology that's going to be subject to disruptive or catastrophic, you know, BP oil spill type events. Um, I think the bat issue is real. The bird issue is not particularly real. The bat issue is real. Um, and they're trying to figure it out. It'll take them time. And uh, there is an aesthetic question, uh, as any industrial process, you know, is going to face that, that question. Um, and I find the windmills personally quite beautiful, uh, but that's a, a question of, of taste. Mm -hmm. um, I think partially in, in response to that, though, you're going to see offshore development as being, a, 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 or interior U.S. development. I mean, one of the, I, I drove across country recently, and I hadn't done it in about 20 years. And boy, it's amazing to see the wind farms along I-80. I mean, they just weren't there 15, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, and they're just mm -hmm. popping up like mushrooms. Mm -hmm. If it's offshore, how's it transported? Under the sea? Yeah. Yeah, cable lines. Yeah. Okay. So you don't have to worry about you know, you have to get the transmission. That's the big challenge for wind, actually, frankly, is transmission. Um, you know, that's the infrastructure investment that would have to be made. Yeah. Uh, some people here were here when uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. was here, so mm -hmm. I'll just share the anecdote of uh, he was championing wind farms as well. After the debate, when the uh, uh, media asked him about uh, the oh, windmills yeah. off Cape Cod yeah. that uh, were offshore. He said, no, 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 we don't need those in Cape Cod, but you know, the wind farms I'm working on in California, those are good ones. So. Yeah, I have to say that uh, I was very disappointed uh, in Mr. Kennedy and, uh, for his opposition to the Cape, farm, Cape, yeah. Cape Wind op, uh, projects. Yeah. Uh, solar. Again, there's some okay. uh, issues with solar. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Solar has, comes in several flavors, all right? So um, there's photovoltaic solar, which is a technology that directly creates electricity from sunlight. Um, there's solar hot water, which I actually just installed in my house. It's got a four-year payback with, uh, um, uh, with uh, in, given this, the way I set it up. Um, so that's just preheating my water. It's going to cut my electricity bill by about half. Um, and then there's uh, a variety of utility-scale solar uh, operations uh, that 
uh, produce electricity in, in sort of farms, mm -hmm. a farm environment. Um, and in that area, you know, every day you read in the paper about some new breakthrough, some increase in efficiency, prices falling, um, and uh, it's got a lot of promise. Now, what, if you read the forecasts, you know, some people say, well, you know, how fast would it have to grow in order, it's only, you know, renewables as a whole are probably about 2% right. of U.S. electricity production right now. So you'd have to have phenomenal growth rates to scale them up to replace coal um, or fuel oil, which we still use in some places, um, or nuclear. Um, and you could look to the German experience, for example. So they've been hard at it for about 15 or 20 years. Um, and I think they're looking to be at around, and I'm not sure about this, this is what I remember, 30% solar by about mm -hmm. 2025 mm -hmm. or 2030. Um, so, you know, to really accelerate these technologies, you would need uh, some policy pushes, like uh, feed-in tariffs in particular seem to be the most effective. Although, you know, the private sector might just deliver in some big way. I mean, uh, because solar has got a huge amount of a promise as a, a disruptive technology because of its distributed nature, right? So you could imagine if you could have cheap solar cells, how that would change everything, right? Mm -hmm. One of the problems that um, wind power has and, 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 and sort of utility scale solar is that they're trying to compete with coal or natural gas mm -hmm. and nobody cares what comes out of their plug, right? Uh, it's electricity, whether it's green or not, it doesn't matter. But if you have a technology like distributed solar that could be on your roof or on your car or in your clothes, that would be a truly disruptive technology and it would be, uh, could spread like, like wildfire. You said clothes a couple of times. Yeah. So what's that about? Oh, there's a lot of people looking at putting solar panels into clothing so that it will do, it'll power your, you know, you can recharge your cell phone while it's in your pocket and, you know, you can, whatever. So, okay. so you're actually, so just think about that. Suppose that you had a constant source of electricity with you everywhere. What would that enable in terms of, of you know, technology innovations? So that will outdate the technology of tanning booths, right? So. Well, yeah, I'm not sure, yeah. Who knows? Um, I did, uh, was given this interesting statistic that if we covered 4% of the deserts in the world, <laughs> that we would produce enough electricity for the entire world. So there is capacity. Yeah, uh, and if you think about all the rooftop space, right. and you know, if you replace your roof, you could put in solar cells in that respect. There's a really interesting project uh, th uh, that um, they're, they're looking at putting a sort of utility, very large utility scale power into Northern Africa with cables under the Mediterranean to feed into mm -hmm. Europe. Okay. Um, so um, there are challenges though. I mean, you know, desert is not unoccupied. Right. There are, there are creatures and endangered species and ecosystems right. there. So, um, you know, again, there is no such thing as, as any kind of uh, trade-off free technology. Right. Should hydropower be part of the mix? And uh, what do you see as the, yeah. the promise and challenges of that? Uh, in, the, in the United States, we pretty much tapped out our large-scale hydro, and in fact, most of the developed world. Uh, you know, the Chinese are building a, a dam a week or something like that in southwest China. Uh, uh, I was I saw a presentation by this. So they're I mean they're basically pushing forwards you know in every different dimension. Um, there is some potential for micro hydro uh, uh, in you know sort of local scale generation, but um, and we're actually going to lose some hydro in the West. Uh, one of the consequences of global warming is that we're going to lose our, we are losing and we're going to more rapidly lose the snowpack in the, in the Rockies and the Cascades. And uh, so water shortages are going to become a reality in the West and those, those big generating dams are going to um, lose their efficacy. Yeah. Um, if any of you have questions you want to write and pass to the center, please feel free to do that. Uh, I've got a couple more alternative fuels to work through, but uh, we'll open it up. Uh, geothermal. Uh, supposedly the geothermal heat pumps are the most efficient, clean, cost effective for uh, you know, controlling CO2 releases and why don't we do more of that? Well, um, 
at Bard, where I teach, we've actually been installing geothermal since the 70s. Uh, it was a great investment. It's cut our electricity and fuel oil bill in particular, because we don't have natural gas there, by uh, a substantial amount. So we can look back at the wisdom of the people who invest in those technologies early on and thank them for that. Um, geothermal can be embedded, uh, and for those of you who don't know, geothermal, what geothermal does is it, it takes the fact that the, the ground temperature is 55 degrees constant, right? So uh, it can take that heat. Uh, if you're, so if the air temperature is colder than 55, you can use the heat in the ground to heat your house. And if it's hotter than that, you can use the coolness in the ground to cool your house. Um, so residential applications. The big breakthrough would be actually um, what some people call hot dry rock geothermal, where you drill down about a kilometer or two and you actually get into some serious temperature differentials from Earth's core. Um, you use it to create steam to drive turbines. And, and this is actually a consequence of fracking technology. Um, this, you use the exact same technology to drill down, frack the, the, the ground at depth, mm -hmm. and, and pump water down there. Instead of getting oil back up or gas, you get steam. Um, earthquakes. Mm -hmm. This is where we have seen some earthquakes. So that we've, they've done some initial developments of this in Switzerland. Uh, where they've done the test analyses of these, and that was the problem. Yeah. So they weren't big earthquakes, but they were enough to sort of uh, to shut the project down. So uh, we have to get a better understanding of, of <laughs> the way that fracking technology affects tectonics before we could really do that. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a very promising technology. You can do it anywhere in the world. Uh, okay. And you could put in a steam turbine. Yeah. Biofuels is another alternative, but uh, I read that sometimes it takes more energy to produce the biofuel than the biofuel itself produces. Yeah, um, so uh, there's also the food versus fuel problem, right? right? So you don't want to make biofuels out of crops like we do now, corn ethanol, uh, because that's going to drive up, especially if demand increases, it'll drive up the price of food. So what you're looking for um, is, uh, is what people call cellulosic ethanol. So baking, basically making uh, ethanol out of woody plant material or grass. Um, and so you want to move to an industry that would be based on a waste, essentially waste products or, or algae um, is another very promising bio, biofuel source. Um, so again, these are areas that need technology. They need R&D. They need entrepreneurs. They need startup. Uh, and, you know there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. I have a student right now who uh, has started a little company in the Hudson Valley. It's called Hudson Valley Grass Energy. And uh, they've built a little mobile mill that'll go around to farmers and they'll use their, um, their, their hay uh, that um, they can't sell or that's gotten wet and can't be used. Um, so there's just all these, and then they'll pelletize it. And, uh, and then you can burn it in a conventional pellet stove. So um, this is the kind of creativity we need, right? So win-win. Farmers make money. There's a local fuel source. You don't have to import, in this case, fuel oil, which is what people are burning from the Middle East. So it's good for national security. So we need to find those sustainable kind of win-win options that uh, are going to allow us to, to scale up biofuels from you know, the farm level to the industrial level. Uh, you talked about transportation a little bit earlier, or mm -hmm. reportedly some 15% of man-made uh, carbon dioxide comes from uh, transportation. Yep. Uh, one of the things we do is spend a little bit more money to buy an electric car, mm -hmm. but then we draw electricity from the coal sure. power yeah, that doesn't do much. The plant, and I don't know if we're ahead of the game or not. Yep. Uh, are you optimistic, A, about uh, finding replacements for conventional uh, automobile engines and truck engines, uh, and being able to encourage people to make a change. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's clean car and there's less car, right? Those are the two solutions. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the clean car side, um, you need to have clean electricity. As you pointed out, if you've got, if you've got fossil fuel intensive electricity, it doesn't do you any good to switch over. But I think the future is going to be in um, uh, plug-in hybrid batteries or, or, or plug-in electrics. Um, and, and if you have a smart grid, so you can feed electricity back to the grid, then you can use your vehicle as a power plant. So let's say you drive to work in your electric vehicle and you plug it in 
uh, but you're going to be sitting there all day. Um, and electricity prices are pretty high, so instead of actually taking power from the grid, you, your battery feeds power into the grid, and they pay you for it, right? And then when you go home at night, when power is cheap, you recharge, and so you're making your own, your own little personal power generator here, and you're making money during the day off of the cheap power at night. So um, I think that that kind of, again, distributed energy system that could back out and replace centralized plants is the way we're going to be heading. Mm -hmm. I saw one poll where uh, more people were interested in producing energy than in protecting the environment. And we just know that uh, there are all these debates about uh, how we balance out one against the other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not a lot of people are really reducing their uh, dependence on energy and electricity. Uh, how do you see it playing out? Are you an optimist? Are you hopeful? Are you uh, thinking that uh, the hurdles are just immense to try to cross? Well, um, I guess my own, my optimism about the last 10 years has been that we've really, I think we've kind of, we're seeing the beginnings of moving beyond this jobs versus the environment, electricity versus the environment, all these trade-offs, and really envisioning ways that we can live our lives that are synergistic. So, because ultimately there can't be a trade-off. You can't, you know, if you don't have an environment, you don't have electricity. If you don't have electricity, you can't enjoy the environment. So you gotta have both. Um, and, and I'll give you an example of this uh, that, I, that I found sort of heartening. So in 2010, in California, there was an initiative placed on the ballot that would have rolled back California's global warming regulations. Um, and it was sponsored by a couple of Texas oil companies. Um, and, um, and so Californians were treated to this sort of full-on debate in the public about, on the one hand, sort of a jobs versus the environment argument. If we don't roll back this regulation, it's going to cost a million jobs for Californians. Versus another campaign that was financed by Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who said, no, 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 this uh, climate regulation that's going to uh, you know, level the playing field for new technologies is California's future that this clean energy future is the way that we need to go. We already have half a million people working in these new industries and we need to nurture them because that's the future, you know? Oil is not, oil is the past. Um, and so you had this, it was, it was, you know, a TV commercial saying jobs versus the environment. No, clean energy future, jobs versus the environment, clean energy future. And, um, and when the dust settled, Californians voted two to one for the clean energy future. So I think that that vision is very compelling um, I think we have lots of stories and anecdotes that I can tell you about companies that are trying to tunnel through that dichotomy and figuring out ways to reduce their footprint and provide better services. And um, in a supportive policy environment, um, those companies grow a lot faster. So, you know, it's a, it, it's, it, you've got to have sort of both policy, entrepreneurs, businesses, all driving in a, in a clean direction. So I think we can do it, absolutely. Okay. Uh, assuming that CO2 is the source of global warming, China, India, and Russia contribute more than 50% of CO2, but they have no plan for reducing carbon dioxide in the next 20 years. Well, uh, what is the U.S. doing to persuade them to do their part? Is this a lost cause? Well, I would say that we're in that same boat with China, India, and Brazil. We have no plans to reduce our emissions in the next 20 years. So. We're all in this together. We're all gonna to sink or swim together. And the Chinese get this. I mean, Chinese wind power production increased 574% last year. Okay, 574%. Um, they see these global markets in wind. Uh, they're producing solar panels like crazy. Now, they're not very high quality, but they're churning them out like mad. So they get this. They wanna be technology leaders. They wanna be in the, in the head of this game. They want to rewire the world with their companies. They don't want our companies to do it. So they're, they're, they've actually are instituting cap and trade systems for greenhouse gas emissions at the provincial level. Their fuel efficiency standards, except until recently when we upped ours, were better than ours. So they have massive public health problems associated with their dependence on coal. So uh, they get climate change. They got lots of very low-lying cities that are, have millions and millions of people in them that they don't want to build seawalls around. Um, they also have, you know, a billion people who live on, you know, less than $6,000 a year, right? So they're trying to figure out how to do, manage both of those things. Um, 
So what we saw in the international process, you know, at Copenhagen and, and, and beyond, is that we've abandoned this idea that there will be sort of a global pact where everybody kind of agrees to cut by a certain amount. And instead what we're going to get is leadership at the domestic level, or not, um, to be a part of this clean energy world um, and to lead the transition and to act responsibly knowing that it's not, we all sink or swim together. So, um, you know, I think leadership in the U.S. is going to enable leadership in China, enable leadership in India, and it'll be a, a race to the top. That I think that's, that's what we have to hope for. Okay. Per unit of electricity available for distribution, how much less percentage-wise CO2 is emitted from a natural gas-fired generating plant than coal-fired? Well, again, if you ignore the fugitive emissions, I think it's about half, but I'm not sure. I'd have to look. Google is a wonderful device. And similarly, how about uh, CO2 emissions per vehicle mile for gasoline engine versus an electric car, assuming the electricity came from the coal-fired generation? There's no advantage. Right. If you're using coal, I don't think there's any advantage to an electric car. I just read that the ocean dropped last year. Please comment on that. Um, well, I don't know where that was read. Uh, sea level has been rising pretty steadily. There may be year-to-year -year fluctuations, um, but uh, you know it's it's going up, um, uh, and we're just beginning to see that. It's rising for two reasons right now: thermal expansion. Um, it's just as the ocean warms, it's just taking up more space. Uh, and we're also uh, getting melt uh, glaciers around the world are melting. So, uh, you know, continental uh, mountain glaciers are, are melting. We're seeing uh, some net loss from Greenland um, and uh, some from the, from the Antarctic. Uh, but those, we're not really seeing large scale losses of ice there yet. So, um, the scientific community has told us that sea levels liable to rise somewhere between sort of at a minimum probably two feet this century and probably uh, up, up the worst case scenario would be six feet I think is kind of what they're saying now. And I guess when you look at, at data, you know, kind of year to year, you know, you really have to think about trends. If something happens in one year or one place at a given time, I mean, I could get up here and tell you, God, has, gosh, excuse me, hasn't the weather been weird this year, right? Mm -hmm. The U.S. is essentially in a drought. There is no snow anywhere. Right? Doesn't that prove global warming? Well, actually, it's been pretty cold in Europe, okay? So, uh, you know, on average so far, the January was the 19th warmest year on record. But in the United States, it's been the fourth warmest. So you've got to be careful about picking, cherry-picking data and sort of looking at one-year trends are what we want to look at. Okay. Do solar and wind need conventional power backup? And if so, how does this affect the carbon footprint of those power sources? Yeah, certainly as, as you ramp them up, you, you have to, they're intermittent sources. Um, and so you need to have them feed into a conventional electricity grid. Now, um, as they grow, who knows? Uh, because we're, we'll be moving more to, to storage technologies that allow you to produce when the wind is blowing, store when it's not. Um, and uh, uh, there's a bunch of solar technologies that are emerging where they have molten salt associated with the plants. So they, they, use, they store the heat in the, that context to generate electricity later on. So you know, at this point, yeah, you couldn't have a completely solar or wind-driven system. But as I said, the Germans are, are heading towards 30%. They've made a commitment to back out not only their coal plants, but their nuclear plants. So they feel they can do it. And, uh, and by the way, their economy's doing fine, you know, as they've made this electricity, gen uh, this, this transition to clean and renewable power, they, they remain one of the manufacturing powerhouses of the world. Um, yeah. Say a word about the Kyoto Treaty, and are we really ignoring it, and should we be doing something different? Well, again, I think this gets back to the international process. Um, 
Kyoto um, was ignored by the United States. Uh, and um, in Copenhagen in 2009, and then there was an attempt to replace it, uh, and that attempt did not really succeed. Um, the European Union will, will re retain its Kyoto commitments and, and the cap and trade system that they set up. Um, but what we're going to see now, as I mentioned, is really not a coordinated global effort where people have targets and timetables, but instead national commitments uh, that uh, we hope will ratchet up uh, in a race to the top. Okay. Give us all of the details. This is to give us the skinny about your solar water heater. How large is it? Consistency in hot water? Is it hot enough for okay. your recovery right. cost? Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Well, I just got it two months ago. I'm quite excited about it. It's very handsome on my roof. I like it. <laughs> what color? They want to know everything. Oh, no. well, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, what do you call it? Basic black, I okay. guess, is, is the word. Um, and uh, it, it, right now it just runs down to my, uh, to my hot water heater in the basement. Um, uh, and it, it's a preheating system, and I'm told that it'll cut my electricity costs by about half. Preheating uh, meaning? So there's, a, there's two tanks. So there's one tank, which is just the normal hot water tank, and then there's another tank. Um, so there's a, you know, basically a, what do you call it, a antifreeze that runs from the, the, the heating unit in, on the roof down to the preheat tank. Uh, and it gets hot up there. Even in the winter, it was like 120 degrees on the roof, you know. And then it uh, heats the water in the preheat tank. And then if uh, that water is hotter than the water coming out of the well, which it typically mm -hmm. is, then that water goes first into the, uh, well, it, it doesn't go in. There's a coil that transfers the heat from that tank into my um, well water tank, right? Yeah. And preheats yeah. the water. Mm -hmm. It can actually fully heat the water in the summer. So in the summer, I won't use any electric. Um, and I'll be curious to see when that starts. Maybe it does start in April or, or May. So I'm following, it's got a computer on it and you can <laughs> sort of yeah. watch what it does. Um, and uh, without government subsidies, it would have about a 10 year payback. Uh, now that's a challenge for most people um, because you think, well, am I really gonna live in my house for 10 years? It's actually a pretty good rate of return. It's like seven or eight percent. It's better than anybody would get in a savings account. But there's a little risk associated with it. Will I really recover that? Mm -hmm. um, you'll get some money back if you sell the house because you got the solar unit. So even mm -hmm. unsubsidized, it's actually a pretty good in just a straight up investment. But to get people to sort of go across that that to cross that divide is pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. So to incentivize it, the feds and the state kicked in a fair amount. So it's now got more like a four percent, uh, a four-year rate of return, which is very attractive. That's like a twenty percent, you know, yeah. rate of return. That's like getting twenty percent in the bank. It's great, you know, and I'll get that forever once it's paid back. Okay. Can you speak to, this is a good question for an economist, can you speak to the costs of extracting and transporting coal in terms of carbon and the social health costs of coal? Well, um, here I will just refer you to a recent article in the American Economic Review, which is the premier uh, journal of peer-reviewed economics by William Nordhaus and, uh, and, and Mendelssohn and another co-author who actually looked at this issue in excruciating detail and, and uh, concluded that there are very high social costs associated with coal, uh, primarily due to uh, premature mortality associated with air pollution from coal plants. Um, and uh, and they, even con they actually concluded that if you look at all the, the social costs associated with, with burning coal, not including the global warming effects, that the cost to the U.S. was about 2.2 times the value of all the wages and profits that were paid out in the coal industry. So if you took out all of the wages and profits that were paid out to the owners and workers in the coal industry, the damages done to other people was about 2.2 times that. Um, now that's other people's research. Um, they're very respected economists. So I'll just leave it at that. A uh, question says, what about tidal power? Tidal power is very interesting. 
yeah, there's a lot of wave power is a very interesting. Uh, I don't know a lot about that one in particular, but um, again, it gives you a sense of the menu of what happens when you look outside the box of ways that we could be meeting our power needs. Somebody wants to know if uh, there is global warming insurance and how affordable mm. would it be in the world economy and who would buy it? What risks would be covered? What do you mean well, when you talk about insurance? That's a very good question. Oh, I will tell you there's global warming anti-insurance. Um, so uh, the, the major insurers are pulling out of Florida uh, and actually all along the coast of the United States uh, because they understand that uh, uh, one of the consequences of global warming will be increased uh, intensity of storms. Uh, that's not to say we there's a demonstrated link between in the record between warmer weather and, and hurricanes. There's some debate about that, but everybody, basically with global warming, what you're doing is you're driving the hydrologic, hydrologic cycle, right? As you warm the planet, you're uh, just putting a lot more water in the atmosphere, a lot more energy, and there is documented evidence that we're getting more intense storms. Not more intense hurricanes, but more intense storms. So, so there's global warming anti-insurance. Um, you can't really buy an individual insurance policy against global warming because uh, it would be very hard to sort of pin any individual weather, of extreme weather event or crop failure or whatever. Or, or you could maybe do it for sea level rise if you would want to get somebody to bet against that, but it's a pretty certain outcome. Um, so when I talk about insurance, I talk about it from a social perspective. Um, what can we do as a society to insure against risks as opposed to it's not really an individual insurance problem. How much pollution or CO2 do wood fireplaces and wood stoves cause? Um, they can be significant for conventional pollutants. Uh, and so there's EPA regulates the, the emissions that come from, regulates the stove construction to try and reduce a conventional particulates. Now, uh, on a life cycle basis, um, wood stoves ought to be more or less carbon neutral. Uh, because the trees grow back um, when you burn them. Now, if you were to clear cut a field and convert it to something else, you know, a housing development or something, and burn the wood, then that would be a net CO2 release. But if you're taking wood from a forest uh, or uh, a, that's, that's regrowing, then um, there shouldn't be a net addition to, to carbon dioxide. And that's sort of the whole biofuel story, is that you can burn the biofuels, you can burn the grass, but then if it grows back the next year, it captures the carbon. Is it possible to poke a hole in the atmosphere, really, the CO2 ceiling, mm -hmm. to force the CO2 into outer space or some other way to get rid of it once it's up there? That's a novel idea. The problem is that it mixes uniformly. Um, so it's not as if it's in a pocket somewhere that you could get it to, to go away. Uh, the only way that we know to get CO2 out, or the, the most effective way we need to know to get CO2 out of the atmosphere is to grow things. Um, and so if we want to sequester carbon, we can grow forests, uh, stop cutting down forests. Um, there's been some new innovations in terms of uh, biochar. Uh, so that if you pyrolyze wood and grind it up, you can put it in soil and it lasts a long time and it has uh, good um, agricultural productivity properties. So you could imagine cutting down forests, pyrolyzing them, pulverizing them, tilling them into the soil to improve your soil productivity, and then growing more forests. And that would allow you to get more carbon into the terrestrial ecosystem. Some people have looked into building concrete out of carbon uh, so, you know, there are people thinking hard about this, but we don't, you know, nature does it better right now than, than anything we can um, duplicate. How can industry more effectively support clean air? This is something we're addressing in the, in the um, sustainable business program that, that I run. Uh, and, uh, there have been a number of industries lately, you know, that is not a question that most industries would have asked, ever really asked, right, uh, in, under an old paradigm. But people are now really beginning to ask that question. Is there money to be made in more effectively 
cleaning the air. And it came from an energy person. Yeah. I mean, a company person. I'll give you, I'll give you a water example, and let's see if I can think of an air analogy. So um, last week, Nike announced that they had developed a new technology that, uh, uh, was, that, that allowed them to do waterless dyeing of textiles. Uh, they're obviously, you know, a clothing manufacturer, so this is of concern to them. And uh, textile dyeing is one of the, the major sources of, of water pollution, especially in developing countries. And so um, Nike didn't, Nike is an interesting company because they have, because since they got burned by their labor practice in the 90s, they've barely got religion and have really focused on, on sort of thinking about sustainability. And, uh, and so they set out to solve, they said this is a problem. This, this water pollution thing is a problem. What can we do to solve it? And they came up with this waterless textile dyeing process. And so here's a bit, and they're going to make money off of it. I mean, it's, it's a great new technology that everybody's going to be adopting and they'll have to pay royalty fees to Nike. So here's an industry that is a clothing manufacturer, right? Or a shoe manufacturer. And yet, they're starting to think, how can we make money by solving environmental problems? By innovating to dramatically reduce footprint. Um, and um, I'll give you another example. So this is a cool, real cool example. There's a friend of mine who works at this company. Another company set out to say, this is a startup in New York. They said, how can we attack this problem of styrofoam? Yeah. Something that many of us use but may not like. You know, what do you do with all those peanut pellets that you have in your life? <laughs> um, and they said, okay, uh, let's use mushrooms. So what this company does is they have, my friend is their chief mycologist. She's a mushroom expert. They grow fungus in big blocks. Uh, um, and because uh, if you think about styrofoam, you know, how do you get it? Well, you got to go drill off the Gulf of Mexico, hundreds of, you know, kilometers down, right? Not hundreds of kilometers, but kilometers down to get the oil. You pull the oil up, you refine it at high temperature, you make styrofoam, you put it around a glass, you use it for three weeks, and then you throw it away and it lasts for 10,000 years. You know, not a very sensible thing. <laughs> they can grow virus, uh, not virus, that's terrible, they can grow fungus, excuse me, uh, in the dark at room temperature with no added energy, right, the way nature does it, and then they can carve it up and they can make little things to, to carry glasses and, you know, peanuts for packing. And coolest of all, they, they, they can, it'll actually attach itself to plywood sheets and you can use it for insulation in, in walls, okay? Mm. And then when you're done with it, you break it up and you put it in your garden, mm. all right? So that kind of vision of how can you take an environmental problem and turn it into a business opportunity is, I think, the way we are gonna avoid this jobs versus environment, electricity versus environment, kind of mindset that we can't really afford in a world that's going to have 9 billion people, you know, all aspiring to a good quality of life. Yeah. When we were skipping through energy sources, we skipped over nuclear power. Mm, okay. Let's say a word about that. You did mention yeah. Fukushima. Yeah. So nuclear uh, does have the advantage of being a low carbon technology. Um, and so uh, if you're going to back out your nuclear plants, you've got to replace them certainly with something, you know, they have that, that, that feature. I think the challenge for nuclear is economic. Um, that, uh, I mean, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, the, the, what do you do with the waste? You know, we, we haven't been able to solve that problem in 50 years. Uh, what about terrorists and plutonium? And it's inherently a technology that requires massive government supervision, massive regulation. Uh, so, you know, it's just not a, it's not a very friendly technology for free markets. It just doesn't, doesn't mix with free markets. The places you see it are France and China and, you know, Asian countries where they have strong government support for industry. Um, we built our plants in the context of a regulated utility structure, right, where these plants were guaranteed, you know, 50-year revenue streams. And in a world where who knows what the solar industry is going to do in five or ten years, if you want to invest four, eight, 12, 15 billion dollars in one facility, that's very risky. So, uh, not to mention if the thing blows up, right, and you've got, you know, liability that's just horrendous. Now, the government provides a, a, a foundational subsidy for the nuclear industry, which, through the Price-Anderson Act, which limits the liability of a pool of, of insurers to something 
some tiny number like $5 billion or maybe it's 20 now, I don't know, but you know, wouldn't come close to covering the cost. So the government would pick up the tab. But even so, people don't want to get in that game. And so the government has thrown lots and lots of loan guarantees in the nuclear industry and nobody's really biting. And I, and I think it's just, and private investors just don't see this as the future. Is there a sufficient rare earth supply to support a major move to photovoltaic energy and the magnets for wind energy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and uh, I have a resource economics background and um, I'm not a real big believer in, for example, peak oil. People who say we're gonna run out of gas or run out of oil um, because it's really driven by economics and when the price goes up, people suddenly find new ways to get at stuff that's not as high quality as the sources that we're used to. Fracking is a very good example of that, right? So, you know, people said, we're running out of natural gas, we're running out of natural gas. So the oil industry responds, I said, well, let's develop a new technology that lets us get lower grade reserves. So, um, you know, uh, Earth is a big place. We haven't really looked too hard. Uh, my sense is that you know, when the prices go up, we'll find some more or we'll find some substitutes. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on that being a major obstacle. I'm just reading this question. Oh, please do, yeah. Okay. It's a political question. Oh, I love political questions. Yes. What do you say to the GOP candidates since none prefers to believe in global warming? If one of them wins and uh, what, decides not to support uh, attempts uh, for alternate energy, what will that do to worldwide competition? Um, well, I would first point out that two of the GOP candidates, Mitt Romney and Newt Gingrich, three years ago were actually quite willing to accept the science of global warming. Romney oversaw the, I think, the introduction of Massachusetts into uh, uh, the, the cap and trade system of Reggie. Um, and so there's, I think we're in the politics of the moment right now. I don't think that that uh, that perspective can really persist. Again, uh, again, I hope I'm wrong, but if it keeps getting hotter throughout the decade. Um, if, uh, uh, if, if, if uh, they were to, you know, cut back significantly on U.S. support for uh, uh, clean energy technologies, uh, clean car technologies, we'd be cutting off our nose to spite our face. There's lots of people ready to eat our lunch on this one and they'll go right ahead and do it. So, you know, it's basically a recipe for staying in the 19th or 20th century. Bad economic policy. Yeah, again, this does not cost us very much, um, but there's, there's a whole suite of in industries that uh, we can either lead in or we can offshore. Is it true that global warming not only suggests hotter hots in the summer, but also colder colds in the winter? No. Um, in fact, there's likely to be more warming in the winter than in the summer. So uh, uh, I believe the signature of global warming is warmer winter nights, is that's really where you get most of it for reasons that have to do with uh, cloud cover, uh, as I recall. Now, we could get snowier winters. So, you know, last year, in the last year, we had snowmageddon and snow apocalypse. Um, and the reason that we don't have much snow this year is not because it's been warm, although it has, it's because it's been dry, right? Um, and as I, I'm, global warming really has two big effects, immediate effects. One is more drought and the other is more floods. And th that sounds paradoxical, but the drought's easy to understand as it dries up and heats up, you know, you know it's gonna get drier and hotter. The flood piece I mentioned, we're driving the hydrologic cycle, more moisture in the atmosphere, more intense storms. Now where that gets distributed depends on a lot of things, but on average, more drought and more floods, uh, or more snowmageddons and snow apocalypses, depending upon uh, how the whole climate system is affected by a warmer planet. But on average, more snow um, around the world. Should one of our insurance policies be to uh, invest some of our resources in exporting green energy to other countries? Yes, I mean, that would be good for the planet. It would be good for our pocketbook. Um, and 
Uh, to do that, you've got to lead, though. And uh, right now, we're importing a lot of our wind. We had the lead in wind power in the mid-1990s. We lost it. Uh, the, the, some of the leading wind companies in the world now are Vestas in, in Denmark, um, the, the up-and-coming Chinese companies. We've had a bit of a resurgence in wind here, because um, we're not that far behind in terms of installation. Uh, and uh, with the stimulus money, um, there, were, there was a lot of money flowing into green tech in the last couple of years. Uh, that's going to run down. So that, for example, that, that fungus company I was telling you about, they got a couple of very critical startup grants from the feds um, that allowed them to move this much more into a commercial sphere. That's going to be American technology. They're, you know, partnering with 3M. Without that federal money, they, good chance they wouldn't be here today. Uh, do you think car manufacturers are resisting replacing gas-powered cars with hybrid and electric? You know, I advise Chevy uh, on a clean energy initiative that they have uh, to try and um, they just introduced the Volt, which is the, the first long-range purely electric vehicle. And, um, the, and they have a couple of high-mileage high new, uh, the Cruise and another one of their cars. Um, they, you know, resisted for many years uh, the imposition of higher uh, fuel economy standards from the federal government, but this year it was basically they just rolled over and said, yeah, please, let's do it. Let's have, you know, 2015, we can do that. 2020, we can do that. So I think, um, you know, they have to worry about their profit margins. They have to worry about, you know, where they're going to make the most money per vehicle, and they still do that on their bigger vehicles. But... And they're all big places and they're, they're conflicting agendas, but there are certainly nuclei, I would say, within all the big car companies mm -hmm. that, that get this challenge of sustainable mm -hmm. transportation and are trying to figure it out. Yeah. And they think it's going to happen, so they want to make money that way. Yeah. Now, the, cars. there is always kind of the, you know, money now versus money later thing, and right. to the extent that it's not going to happen for five or ten years, they're less interested in it. Right. Is it feasible for the coal industry to transform itself into more renewables to avert a complete collapse of the industry? Uh, I think it's easier for the oil and gas industry because of the technologies that they use for fracking and geothermal. And so there's sort of a more natural transition there. You know, I, my, I, Response to that is, you know, it was hard for the buggy whip manufacturers to transition into the vehicle industry. And um, I think you need to think about the state, you know, the communities rather than the industry in particular. Um, and I, I was talking with the reporter earlier on about, I was in, uh, lived in Oregon for 15 years. Um, and uh, in the early 90s, there was just tremendous fear that uh, the Oregon and Washington economies would just collapse because of the dramatic reductions in timber harvest. And uh, that was brought on in part by endangered species protection, in part just the fact that they pretty much exhausted the good stuff and there wasn't, you know, they just couldn't sustain high levels of yield anymore. And, um, and that didn't happen. Um, the, even in the more timber dependent communities, you just haven't seen the collapse of uh, you know, uh, uh, of economies. Partially that's because of the clean energy industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, farmers in the eastern Oregon are, are picking up tax revenue from wind generation that they didn't have, um, and biofuels. Uh, so, you know, there was, Oregon is an interesting place because for the 20 years leading up to that collapse, there was sort of a concerted effort to put in place policies that would attract clean energy. And so now there's a couple of international Wind companies have got their headquarters there, there's solar fab plants, there's biofuel production facilities. And so they really, that's a state that really did make the transition from a resource dependent economy um, where there were, and there have been significant reductions in timber employment into this clean energy future. Um, I think West Virginia is, you know, positioned close enough to the East Coast uh, hubs that you know you, you can envision you know entrepreneurs relocating here for the lifestyle and you know the low land prices um, and, and you know sort of replicating that kind of a, a process 
and, and you know, the, the beautiful environment. So um, I guess, but the reality is, is, and again, I hope I'm wrong, but I think it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. Coal industry is going to face pressures, and it's just the industry itself, as I say, it's already shrunk by, you know, half or more in the last 30 years. It's used to shrinking. It's going to keep shrinking, and the state needs to transition to something else. Okay. Getting down to just a few questions. Uh, what are the opportunities for students in energy engineering and uh, the demand for students in uh, these fields? How great is it? It's vast. Uh, it's truly wide open. Um, I, you know, I think uh, that's where the money is these days in terms of, you know, the, the global energy market is huge and, uh, and it's, it's on the verge of being hit by a whole wave of disruptive technologies. And, you know, that's, that's where you want to be if you're, if you're an engineer. In 1974, uh, Richard Nixon said that we ought to be pursuing energy independence. Mm -hmm. Is that a goal that's uh, desirable, or would that have uh, some negative consequences? Um, I think it's desirable. Uh, I think to the extent that we can localize our energy sources, it's good for us and it's good for everybody. Um, so if we can lead in developing technologies that allow communities to produce their own power, whether it's wind power or geothermal or solar, uh, and, and make those technologies cheap, then, you know, people around the world are going to want to buy them. And so not only do we become independent of, you know, Iranian and Iraqi and Libyan and Venezuelan, I mean, you name the countries, oil, right? Um, they do too. And it makes the world a more stable and, and safe place. Okay. What's the role of increasing efficiency? in addressing our yeah. power needs. Actually, and I should have mentioned that up front, efficiency is what you want to do first. Um, it's really the, the, what Amory Levins calls negawatts. It's, it's absolutely the biggest source of, of untapped energy that we have in the country. Um, and uh, so much more efficient lighting technologies. We've got this whole LED revolution that's coming down the pipe at us that's going to allow us to you know, light our, our, our rooms and do them in very different ways at a fraction of the energy use that we're consuming right now. Um, uh, building efficiency, um, uh, leaky buildings are a primary source of, of uh, waste, and of course it's an incredible job source. If you pay people here to weatherize homes, uh, you know, you, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Last question, you can respond with anything you want. Uh, what changes do you think will be necessary for us to develop sufficient political willpower to meet the challenges you've been discussing? Well, you know, I, um, I've started the C2C Fellows thing that I start, uh, that I run, is a, it's a weekend training workshop for young people. Um, and I don't know if you, how many people knew, know this, but you only have to be 25 to run for Congress. That's what the Constitution says. Now, the average age of a congressman is about 57 or 56, right? So I kind of think that the Founding Fathers are sending, sent us a message wrapped up in the Constitution that the way to solve our problems is to pay attention to what they said, that they felt like we needed 26-year-olds in Congress and 27-year-olds in Congress, and we don't have any right now. So what we do in our training workshop is we work with young people and say to them, look, you guys get global warming. You've been learning about it. It's not like you're in, you know, it's not a hoax to you. You understand this is your future. You want to do something about it. What do you do, right? What could you do in your 20s to really change the world? And your 20s is a great time to change the world because you don't necessarily have kids. You probably don't have a mortgage. You know, if you lose a job, it doesn't matter. No one's really going to care. So this is the time that you really want to, to be aggressive and really pursue, pursue change. You know, Martin Luther King was 32 when he died, and Jesus was 32 when he died. So those are two guys that made a big impact in their 20s, right? So it can be done. And so we challenge students to think, what skills do you not have right now that you would need to make a difference by the time you were 25, to run for Congress, to, to run for mayor, to be a state legislator? to start a green business, and, and really try and help them think big and broad. And I think that 
um, to the extent that as an educational institution we can uh, engage young people in thinking uh, not in some distant future about how they're going to make an impact on the world, but now or in the next three or four or five years, I think that's um, what I have most hope for and optimism from. Uh, our next program is on Thursday, March 8th for tonight. I uh, sincerely thank you, even Goodstein, Pleasure. for being with us. It's yep. been very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you.